Now let us begin our class on the Shurangama Sutra. We were talking about the Noble Sutra teaching the 11 perceptions from the words of the Buddha. Now that you don't have your cell phones, maybe it's difficult for you to receive it digitally, so it will be distributed on Sunday. And remember to memorize, to keep the 11 perceptions in your heart. To me, I have already passed on my, um, I have already fulfilled my duty and passed on this teaching to you, but I feel that it's necessary for me to remind you to keep this wonderful teaching in your heart. Ponsu Rinpoche kept on reminding us to remember this particular teaching, especially at the time of facing death. <laughs> So I really encourage you to place great importance of it. The unsurpassed, profound, and wonderful Dharma is difficult to encounter in billions of aeons. I now see it here to receive and uphold it, vow to fathom it as a true meaning to liberate all beings, let's generate the supreme bodhicitta. Now let us begin our class and uh, continue with our class on the Shrangama Sutra. Currently, we are starting. Uh, currently, we're studying the part where the twenty-five great disciples of the Buddha expounds their different stories of how they attained realization. Each of them would give different introductions and uh, give the stories of how they attained realization. The first five disciples shared their stories of attaining realization through relying on the five objects. Today we will continue to expound on the object of Dharma as well as the five roots. Each of the disciples would then tell their personal experience of their realization. This is really similar like a drama or like a performance. If you can make a performance out of this script, that would be really wonderful. The story of Mahakashapa, for example, you can make a script of how he told the story of how he attained realization, and then how the other arhats as well as the bodhisattvas attained realization. Each of those disciples could retell their stories of how they attained realization. This kinds of performance would be quite meaningful. When you have the opportunity or whenever you have some uh, dharmic entertainment activities such as dancing, uh, the Vajra dances, and so on, you can make the performance in such a way where each of the 25 disciples reiterated their stories of realization. Today, let us look at the Mahakashapa, pure golden light bhikshuni, how they attained realization first. Let's look at the sixth disciple who tells his story, Mahakashapa and pure golden light bhikshuni and others arose from their seats, bowed at the Buddha's feet and said to the Buddha, In the past Kalpa in this region, I drew near to the Buddha named Sun Moon Lamp, who was then in the world. I heard Dharma from him and cultivated the studies with him and studied with him. Over here, the great Kashapa and uh, purple golden light Bhikshuni. And others, some other retinues also, arose from their seats, bowed at Buddha's, uh, Buddha's feet, and then said to the Buddha in such a way that in the past, in the last, uh, in the last Kalpa, in the past Kalpa, in this Saha world, I drew near to the Buddha, whose name was Sun Moon Lamp. 
who was then in the world, I heard a dharma from him and cultivated and studied with him. So this is the story of the previous life of Mahakashapa. I think I told the story of Mahakashapa before. His life was quite interesting as well. I think it was that his father, his parents, always wanted to have a child. However, they, their wish had never been fulfilled, so they then supplicated to a tree spirit after prostrating to this tree spirit for three years. He made this vicious vow by saying that I will prostrate for seven days. After seven days, if there is no sign, if our wishes are not fulfilled, I will cut this tree off. After speaking of this, the tree spirit got quite scared, so he went to the four heavenly kings. The four heavenly, ki four heavenly kings couldn't do anything about it either, so all of them then went to King Indra. At King Indra's observation, he noticed that the family has great merit. That is why the sentient being in this desire realm cannot take rebirth over there because their merits would not be able to match with this family. And then they went to see Brahma, and then Brahma used his divine eye to make the observation. At that time, there is a deva that's about to end uh, that, that his um, uh, life as the deva is about to end, so he requested to take rebirth in this family. And then he said, I could go to this particular family, but I, don't, I, I would not want to generate any wrong views after taking birth in this family, because that would mean that I would be reborn in lower realms. And then Brahma assured him, saying that, oh, don't worry, I should, I should let the ground the earth protector and the four great heavenly kings to protect you in such a way you will not generate any wrong views. So this deva, this celestial being, directly take rebirth in this family, and then ever since he was born, he had lots of habitual tendencies of being renounced and to study as a monastic. So he doesn't want to be a lay practitioner, but his father really wanted him to inherit I inherent the um, family wealth, so he requested the, the child, the son, saying that you have to uh, get married and then you have to inherit the wealth of our family. But he said that if I were to get married, I have to get married with a woman whose whole body is in the color of gold. In that way, I would get married with the power and influence of this family, after searching everywhere, they indeed have found this golden-colored woman. And then this golden-colored woman also wanted to be, uh, re uh, also wanted to have a renounced life, doesn't want to live a worldly, worldly life. And then the families, the two parents from these two families, lock them up, lock this uh, man and woman together in one room, but they slept in different beds because they don't want to break their vows. And then the family, the two families took away one bed so that they can sleep in one bed. And then in this way, they, these two take turns in the sleeping time. There was this once, the bhikshuni, the purple gold colored bhikshuni, at the time of about, uh, about falling asleep, a poisonous snake swam onto her hand. And then Mahakashapa at that time used the handle of uh, uh, an umbrella to get the poisonous snake away, and then she woke up. After she woke up, she said that, are you, are you touching my body? And then Mahakashapa said, no, it was not me. And then, she, and then he explained what had happened. 
And then she said, I, I would rather to have the poisonous snake to um, touch my body, but not a man, because a poisonous snake would destroy this lifetime alone, but the man's touch would lead to the rebirth in lower realms for lifetimes. So they had kept living in such a celibate life and obtained their pure precepts for 12 years. This couple's story is considered very well known in the history of Buddhism. Ponsu Rinpoche once said that normally, as mundane beings, living with the opposite sex would lead to the defilements of precepts. However, if the if the people if people can be like Mahakashyapa, then that is a very special case. I have translated the story and uh, it is included in the teachings of the Pure Land as well as aspiration to be reborn in Sukhavati. This particular story actually is originated from the Vinaya Sutra. This is a very special story about a quite unique um, precept holder. Living with the purple gold colored bhikshuni for twelve for twelve years, neither of them had to break their vow nor be defiled by it. So that's the history and the story of the two. Now let's look at the sutra, continue with the sutra. After that Buddha's extinction, I made offerings to his sharira and the lit lamps to continue his light. Purple golden light gilded the Buddha's image. In the, this is the continuation of the story. Over here it talks about after the sun and moon lamp Buddha's passing into extinction, after into, he passed into nirvana, then Mahakashyapa made offerings to his sharira and continuously to lit lamps and incense without any interruptions. And then later on, maybe because there are some cracks or uh, certain things happened to the original stupa, so he mended the stupa that made offering to the sharira uh, or to the relics of the Buddha, and then gilded the Buddha's image with the purple gold, which is considered as the best type of gold. Usually it is considered that the Jambuvipa, pure gold, is of the color of purple. So he gilded the image of the Buddha with this purple gold. From that time on, in life after life, my body has always been perfect and has shone with a purple golden light. So ever since then, my body had been always perfect, and then it has always shone forth the purple golden light. So his image is very beautiful, and his body's color is also golden. In our current world and society, we can see that there are people who have really good skin, and some people really wish to have those wonderful skin and uh, good good image. However, their appearance cannot meet their goal because on one hand it is because they had not accumulated enough merit, especially making offerings of flowers, the lamps, also building the stubas of, uh, for the, uh, the Buddhas or building the varieties of shrines and so on, because those kinds of activities are very much related to the uh, a person's appearance. And then the bhikshuni, purple golden light, and others make, uh, make up my retinue. And we all brought forth the resolve for Bodhi at the same time. This had been ex included in the Sutra of Miscellaneous 
uh, metaphors as well as other sutras. There's a story saying that the Sharira, the relic stupa of the Sun, Moon, and Lamb Buddha, after it started getting a little bit of uh, corruption, and then there was this pure, th this poor woman who begged everywhere and finally got a little bit of gold and then she made a great aspiration to mint the stupa and then at that time she found a craftsman and the craftsman was very skilled and then the poor woman finally got a little bit of gold so two of them together joined hands and made aspiration and mended the stupa the craftsman gilded the stupa with the gold provided by the poor woman. They also made it as aspiration that they will be husband and wife for lifetimes and make offerings to the three jewels in all their lifetimes together. And they also vowed to, uh, to uphold the pure perception, to conduct meaningful activities and protect the teachings of the Tathagata and so on. They made all of those great aspirations. Because of their great aspirations, then their future life became as so. In some of the commentaries, it says that uh, the Buddha that they must Made, they made the aspiration to was the Samun and Lamp uh, Buddha. Some said that it's uh, the uh, Vipashin Buddha. <laughs> Because they made those offerings, because they made those aspirations, in 91 Kalpas, both of their bodies are of a golden light and they're very beautiful. It is because of their particular way of upholding the virtuous activities. And then um, Mahakashapa continued to say that I contemplate that the world's six sense objects change and decay. They are, but empty stillness. The six objects, of course, includes form, sound, uh, fragrance, taste, touch, and dharma. And then by practicing upon it, let it be the object of form or object of fragrance, all of those would change and decay. They are but empty stillness. They are but um, dr a dream and as an illusion. There is really nothing that is truly and solidly existent. Dharma being the object of consciousness is simply a mere image, so it is not truly existent. Now, the form, sound, touch, and all of those kinds of dharmas at the time of using wisdom to make observation, we would not be able to get anything at the very end. Everything would come to decay. But here, Mahakashapa did not attain realization through the six dusts or the six objects. Rather, he attained realization by practicing up on the object that is the Dharma. It is at the very end after the five objects had already uh, ceased, and then there is the image that appears in front of consciousness. This is the object of Dharma. He relied up on the object of Dharma to attain realization. That is the most subtle part. And he said that they are but empty, still, uh, empty stillness. Based on this, I cultivated the extinction. Now my body and mind can pass through hundreds of thousands of kalpas as though they were a finger snap. It was simply the time of uh, uh, snapping of the fingers. It was said that he abide in meditation in the uh, Jizu mountain, and he would come out of his samadhi at the time of uh, birth of uh, uh, Maitreya Bodhisattva. He attained realization at the time of practicing upon the dust of Dharma. 
Unlike some of us, we can only practice for half an hour to one hour to practice meditation. That is, uh, I'm not sure how some of you are doing in the actual practice class. Um, are you doing well or not? Because to simply engage in practice can be quite painful to those who are, who do not engage, who do not like to engage in the actual practice. But when we look at Mahakashyapa, he can meditate in such a way that abiding for hundreds and thousands of kalpas is just like a snap of finger. It's just in such a short period of time. And he has such a high level of realization. The Buddha um, be trusted him with the Dharma. In fact, at the time of the Buddha bestowed the Dharma to him, he be trusted the Dharma to him, he must be quite old already because he was 20 years senior to the Buddha. The Buddha passed away at the age of 81 at that time, but Mahakashapa has already reached the age of 100. So sometimes if we were to see capable disciples in our classes, though that they can be more senior than you, or more senior to you, you can still be trust the Dharma to them. In the, the history of the Tibetan Buddhism, it talks about how he protected the Dharma teaching for 40 years and then passed it on to uh, an Venerable Ananda and then uh, seven generations afterwards. From that particular angle, we can see that Mahakashapa indeed is the heir of the Buddha. And another particular characteristic of him is that he is excel excellent at meditation as well as he uh, upholds his precepts in such an excellent way. So if we were to uh, give the Dharma teachings to the others and to trust the others with the Dharma teachings on one hand, that person should have good meditation and the other is that the other person should have very pure precepts uh, because with the combination of precepts and meditation, wisdom would naturally arise. <coughs> Based on the emptiness of dharmas, I accomplish arhathood. The world-honored one says that I am foremost in dutta practice. I've talked about the 12 dutta practices. Nowadays, in the Theravada traditions, the dutta practice is still widely practiced. It is a practice of ascetic, of ascetic, of um, great constraints. There are different requirements such as uh, the limitation of possessions and uh, different ways of sitting and sleeping and so on. It is said that in the later years of Mahakashapa, people tried to ask him to live more of a relaxed lifestyle, but he still uh, preferred to carry out his lifestyle in such an uh, ascetic way until his manifestation of passing into nirvana or passing into this uh, state of meditation. Mahakashapa continued to say that a wonderful dharma brought me awakening and understanding. So at the end, he had reviewed this subtle nature of dharma, that is the non-duality of luminosity and emptiness, the true Tathagatagarbha, that is all-pervasive, and uh, this kinds of realization had been reviewed. All of the afflictions, such as ignorance, anger, and uh, desire had been extinguished. 
The Buddha asked about perfect penetration. What is your perfect penetration? The Buddha asked me. If the Buddha were to ask, as I have been certified to it, dharmas are the superior means, because he attained realization through dharma. He attained realization of emptiness through uh, dharma. So for him, dharma is the most superior means. After we studied this uh, Shrangama Sutra, then we would be able to understand that uh, the Dharma are the most uh, superior. According to Tibetan Buddhism, as there are lots of different schools and different schools as to the Chinese Buddhism. So when it comes to different people, whatever kinds of schools, whatever kinds of um, sects of the particular um, lineage of teachings, each of the lineage and each of the schools and sects would, would claim that their teachings are the most superior. For example, in the Ati practice and in the Maha Mudra, Maha Ati, so on and so forth, whenever we talk about all the Mahas, uh, those are considered as the most superior means within the Tibetan tradition. In the Chinese tradition, they would talk about uh, seeing the true nature and uh, uh, to practice in chanting the Buddha's names and the Pure Land Dharma teachings, the Zen Dharma teachings. All, of course, all of those different methods could be the most superior, most swift way to attain realization to the ones who made connections to that particular method. To give you an example, people who, who are used to drive tractors, they they can't drive um, sports cars and vice versa. So whatever kinds of chariot is the best for you is very much based on your own uh, your own disposition, your own capacities. So you shouldn't think that, oh, I studied this particular method, it's the best, and if you don't study like me, you will never be able to attain realization. That is really not true, because you may be very much connected to this particular method, but not necessarily necessarily the same to the others. All the realized ones that did not say that at all. Rather, they would say that, oh, this particular dharma, this particular method is really good. And they would say that uh, the other one is also really good. But to me, um, the best method would be uh, Mahakashapa, like Mahakashapa to me, the best method is to practice up on the Dharma. This is really the best. Now this is the, the sixth example. Let's look at the seventh, which is by relying on six roots. The next one is Aniruddha. Aniruddha is the cousin of the Buddha. We had studied the story of him as well. Aniruddha rose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet, and said to the Buddha, when I first left home, I was found I was fond of sleeping all the time. The thus come one once scolded me and said I was no better than an animal. And he rode over here after uh, prostrated to the Buddha and said that at first I really enjoyed sleeping. I'm so fond of sleeping, just as some of our fellow practitioners also enjoy sleeping a lot. I heard that there are a few within the male Sangha and a few within the female Sangha. Some are monastics, some are lay practitioners. Tomorrow is going to be Sunday and probably you are going to sleep in again. And just like Aniruddha, who is very fond of sleeping at all times. And then the last come one scolded him and said that he was no better than an animal. According to some commentaries, there are 
quotations of the Buddha saying that the Buddha once spoke this way to him, hey, hey, how can you sleep like an oyster or a clam? Sleep, sleep for a thousand years, but you will never hear the Buddha's name. This is quoted, that's the teaching uh, or that's the scolding from the Buddha uh, included in the commentary. If a person were to sleep a long period of time, then they would be just like an oyster or a clam that's basically sleeping at the bottom of the ocean for hundreds and even thousands of years without any problem. And for such a to build such a cause would lead to not hear the Buddha's names in the future. And then after being scolded, when I heard the Buddha's scolding, I wept and, up, and upbraided myself. For seven days I did not sleep, and I lost the sight in both of my eyes. After being scolded by the Buddha, he was completely heartbroken and kept on crying and um, reprimanded, and uh, he also upbraided himself for seven days and seven nights without sleeping and uh, practiced with great diligence. Some of us tend to do that as well. After being scolded or after certain kinds of conditions, we would practice for two or three days with great diligence but then give up after three days. In fact, a long-term diligence really needs habitual tendencies of past lives as well as great merits. Otherwise, some of people upon hearing the merits of diligence, um, they would only be diligent for two or three days and then they would uh, fall back to their old habitual tendencies again. We do need to have good sleep and uh, uh, sufficient sleep, but from even the sci scientific point of view, if one were to sleep for over eight hours, there is a negative impact on longevity. Also, uh, if people were to sleep longer and not to have sufficient movement, that could result in negativity of uh, the uh, physical health as well. So you definitely need to have more of a combination between sleep, um, a balance, the combination between sleep activity and the stillness. Now that we have very regular steady contemplation and practice, I think majority of our Sangha members would get up very early in the morning and then stay up quite late at night for occasions. Occasionally, I think it could be good to take some rests, but it would be better for us to be uh, more accustomed to study and uh, contemplation uh, with great diligence. If one were to be accustomed to sleep, then people would tend to sleep even during class and then they would get late to class very often, and uh, it's difficult to change those kinds of habitual tendencies. Aniruddha, unlike us, he was quite diligent and practiced for seven days and seven nights, and then he lost both of his eyesight, just as some people would stare at computers for day and night, and uh, that would definitely hurt their eyesight. The world honored one taught me the Vajra Samadhi of the delightful seeing, which illuminates and is bright. Although I had no eyes, I could contemplate the ten directions with true and penetrating clarity, just as if I were looking at a piece of fruit in my palm of my hand. The thus come one certifies me of uh, having attained our hardship. So at that time, 
since the Buddha thinks, since, since our Niruddha already was blind and then um, the world honored one bestowed great compassion upon him and then taught him the samadhi uh, that is called the Vajra Samadhi of the delightful seeing. After practice upon this samadhi, he doesn't need his flesh eyes to see anymore. He was able to see the ten directions with the, uh, penetrating clarity, and he was able to see the truth and was able to see the nature of the Dharma of the Ten Directions just as someone seeing the mango fruit in the palms. And that time he does not see with his flash eyes or with his um, eye root. And then the thus come one certified me as having attained arhatship. In our world, if we do not have the root of I, maybe it could be a favorable condition. I think many of us need to prepare ourselves for it. When we get aged, we could lose the sensitivity and the capacity of our of our roots, of our um, sensory organs. Maybe sometimes it's the ears, sometimes the eyes, and sometimes the others. I sometimes contemplate if I were to not be able to use my eyes when I'm old, what would I do? And then I also remember that upon Sogar Rinpoche all the way between 1990 to 2004, in nearly 14, in over 14 years of time, he did not have the ability to read or see any of the words, but his teaching and his empowerments and the spreading of the Dharma had never been interrupted. So his teaching did not rely on the eye root, rather relied on his supreme wisdom and uh, perseverance. Once I met uh, Kempo Chimirinsen in uh, Konding, and he was quite ill with eye illness. And I said that if I were to be ill in such a way, I probably won't be able to uh, turn that situation onto the path of Dharma. But I think maybe for you, it is a favorable condition. I said, is it that if you don't see very well, but you can still ask the others uh, to transcribe by this kinds of causes and conditions that he composed a great numbers of commentaries and uh, uh, shastras. In fact, people with great perseverance, though without the roots of eyes, they would be able to still illuminate the world, just as, for example, the uh, American author Helen Keller whom lived in 19th or 20th century, and she was considered as a great um, author. She lost her hearing and sight at a very young age, but she, by relying on her perseverance, she read the great numbers of books and then composed a great numbers of books. Even people with eyes would not be able to compare to her achievements. So on one hand, without the six roots, it would be difficult for us, but on the other, from the Shrangama's point of view, even after the roots, the sensory organs were to be destroyed, on the other, uh, we would be able to find a perspective to attain realization. 
And then the Buddha asked about a perfect penetration. As I have been certified to it, returning the seeing back to its source is the foremost method. It is to look back instead of looking at the organ of the eye, rather to look at the source. We would be able to let go of all kinds of forms on the outside or as objects, rather by relying on the source of seeing, then I have attained the realization and finally found the true face of uh, Tathagatagarbha. This is my practice, and I am renowned as the foremost uh, in such a way. So in such a way, without eye roots, it would be even better because I attained realization, he, as he said. That was the seventh story about realization. Now, the next one is by relying on the nose. Um, over here it says that Kshudra Pantaka rose from his seat bowed at the Buddha's feet and said to the Buddha that I am deficient in the ability to memorize and do not have much in it intelligence. So over here, Shudra Pantaka arose from his seat and after bowed to the Buddha, saying that I don't have a good memory, I'm not very good at upholding the sutras and uh, to study, I do not have such kind of wisdom. And then he continued to say that when I first met the Buddha, I heard the Dharma and left the home life. But when I tried to remember one line of a verse by the Das Kamwana, I went through a hundred days remembering the first part and, and forgetting the last, or remembering the last and forgetting the first. Kshudra Pandaka was asked to memorize a shloka, a verse by the Buddha, and he kept on memorizing this one one shloka within 100 days. During the recitation period of this particular shloka, he would remember the first half and then forget about the second half and then remembering the second half and forgetting the first. Even after all of the herders around him could memorize all of those shlokas, because he still could not re remember it. According to the autobiography of um, uh, Zeng Guofan, it also says that when he was trying to memorize a shloka, a, a verse, or memorizing uh, something in the evening, he kept on repeating it at night. And there was a thief in his house at that time. The thief waited and waited, trying to steal something something from his household, uh, but uh, uh, Zeng Wofan couldn't memorize that verse even till uh, daylight time. And then the thief got really angry and repeated that verse to him and then left. Though he was considered as one of the very influential person in the Chinese history, however, he's memory is similar to Kshudra Pantaka. The verse that Kshudra Pantaka tried to memorize was a verse from the Vinaya Sutra. It says that don't do evil with deeds of body, mouth, or mind. Don't bother any living beings in the world. With proper thought, regard the desire realm as empty and stay far away from non-beneficial practices. So it says that the three gates do not engage in any of the vice deeds with the three gates and do not harm and bother the sentient beings. One should make observation of one's own mind with right mindfulness, and then that leads to the realization of emptiness, and then stay far away from the non-beneficial practices. This particular teaching is very important, not only to Kshudra Pantaka, but to all of us. This is a very profound teaching. 
a very profound teaching to Kshudra Pantaka. Similarly, we should memorize it too. We should be able to memorize it within 100 days. I try to memorize it in the afternoon, and I think I have no problem of memorizing it. Don't do evil with the deeds of body, speech, and mind. Don't bother any living beings in the world with proper thought regard to the desire realm as empty, and stay far away from non-beneficial practices. So you should memorize it too. Now, why, do, why does uh, Kshandra Pantaka has a terrible memory? I think I've told you that story before. It was his previous life when he was a Tribhutaka a Dharma master, but he was very miserly in giving the Dharma teachings to the others. And because of this particular karma, he was born as a foolish one, or rather not very sharp um, for many lifetimes. Some also said that he attained realization while um, sweeping the floor. Anyhow, he indeed can be considered as someone with great diligence. Over here, then, the next part says, the Buddha took pity on my stupidity and taught me to relax and regulate my breath. The Buddha asked him to stay at one place and then practice to relax and uh, make breathing in and out as his practice. In the practice of Theravada, the practice of breathing is quite important. The practice of breathing within Vajrayana teaching is very much included in the six bardos. It is Oma Hong, which is the seeds of the body, speech, and mind of all the Buddhas. Our breathing, breathing at the time of breathing in, we visualize the white om melt into our heart center. At the time of breathing, we visualize in such a way and then abide, which is to stop breathing and to hold this breath. At that time, there is the visualization of the red ah, that is the speech, the vajra of speech of the Buddhas. And then at the time of breathing out, that is the blue syllable, hom. So you should practice om, ah, and hom in such a way. At the time of breathing in, that's the, um, that is the white om, and then at the time of holding, it is the red ah, and then the breathing out is the blue hom. Each round includes the three syllables and has the three steps. I think Master Nan Hui Jing stated that in order to practice breathing, the most important part of the breathing, the key, is to abide is the part where you hold the breathing, that is the more, most important. So he would count on holding of the breathing. So that could be considered as one part of, one aspect of the traditional practice. Whichever kinds of practice of breathing you are practicing in or you want to practice, the key is to um, eradicate all, uh, um, all dualistic thoughts. In the Vinaya Sutra, it says that the Buddha had practiced the, pra the breathing practice for two months. So let it be in Buddhism or in the worldly yoga traditions or some of the Qigong traditions, breathing is considered as one of the most essential. 
there are people who attend realization through practice upon breathing. Now let's continue to look at uh, the next part over here. He continued to say that I contemplated my breath thoroughly to the subtle point in which arising, dwelling, change, and extinction happen in every kashana. My mind suddenly attained vast and non-obstruction until my outflows were extinguished. So at the time of practicing breathing in and out in such a way, his root of the nose and the consciousness of breathing in and out slowly comes to the more subtle or the most subtle until it completely exhausted. After the breath thoroughly comes to the subtle point, at that time the arising, dwelling, change, and extinction that happens in each kashana is simply without production and without a cessation. At the time that breath is taking in its course, the arising, dwelling, change, and the cessation or the extinction is without production and without cessation. There is nothing to be obtained. And within that moment, he attained realization. He understood that there is not a form that is truly existent. At that time, without any obstruction, at that time, he attained uh, the realization that is without any obstruction. At that point, by relying on the organ of the nose, he understood the nature of breathing. He understood the nature of arising, dwelling, change, and extinction. And then, um, all the outflows were extinguished and uh, he accomplished arhathood. Beneath the Buddha's seat, he was sealed and, certif and certified as being beyond study. And then he continued to say that the Buddha asked about a perfect penetration as I have been certified to it. Turning the breath back to emptiness is the foremost method. So he said that if the Buddha were to ask me what is the, the perfect penetration route, to my understanding, to my experience, in fact, it is to turn back, turn the breath back to emptiness is the foremost method because in such a way there is no attachment to the object of the external phenomena. To us, our nose, the, the sensory organ of the nose usually would hold onto or um, to grasp onto the object of fragrance. But instead of searching for the fragrance, if you were to look at its nature, to turn back and look at its nature, and then um, see emptiness of it or attain the emptiness of it, then one would be able to attain realization of the true emptiness. Kshudra Pantika is considered as being rather of a dull capacity because he doesn't have good memory. But without a good memory, we can see that his nose is pretty good. All of the disciples that we are studying today, other than uh, Mahakashapa, the rest of them either uh, do not have eyes or, do, or are rather quite of dull capacity, or the next one is to have a dull tongue. In such a way, uh, we can see those examples of those disciples that relied on the different roots but still attained realization. So we shouldn't look down at those without a perfect endowment of the roots. And uh, uh, on, top of that, on top of that, if we were to lose the sense organs or uh, not to have those capacities, we should also rely on those as a favorable condition to attain realization. And then the next disciple is Gavampati. Gavampati arose from his seat about at the Buddha's feet and said to the Buddha, I have a mouth karma created from the past offense. 
So over here, um, he said that I slided a shramana, and in life after life, I've had this cow cut sickness. After Gavampati bowed at the Buddha's, seat, uh, Buddha's feet and then said to the Buddha, I have a mouth karma created from past events was because I slighted a shramana from the past life of my, and then for such reason I had this sickness that is uh, like the cow cud. We studied this story before. There was once a shramana in the large sangha because he doesn't have very good teeth and he couldn't really swallow after, uh, while trying to, um, wh while eating. The previous life of Gavampati was the manager of the Sangha or supervisor of the Sangha or something. At that time, he kept on rushing the old Shramana saying that quickly, quickly eat it, do not eat it like a, 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 a yak. So he used those negative language to make fun of this old Shramana, and because of that karma, he was born as a cow. And because of that habitual tendencies of being reborn as a cow was not eradicated, he carried that on to his, uh, this lifetime of being reborn as a human. As you know, um, the cows and yaks would ruminate. They would um, regurgitate the previously consumed feeds and then chew it further afterwards. So I was quite familiar with that uh, tendency, that habitual tendency of the yaks, because I used to sleep with the yaks in the evening uh, when I was little, because we lived in a tent, and then I would sleep with the calves of the yak, especially when it's really cold in the evening. I would cuddle them and sleep with them, and then I can hear them um, regurgitate, or I can hear them cut, cut chewing. They would make that kind of uh, sound while chewing. They would chew the feed that they had during the day. And to me, those are just like the white noise to my sleep. Those are Those are some of the um, habitual or the, the, the traits of the yaks and cows. Sometimes whenever we hear people eating, if they can't swallow, they also would make those kinds of sounds. And then he said that the Daskam one called me the mind ground dharma door of purity of a single, single flavor. My thought was extinguished. I entered samadhi. So the Buddha taught him a teaching that is the dharma door of the purity of a single flavor. A single flavor is that through chewing through the tongue, all of the flavors are of one, one, uh, uh, one dust. So let it be sour, sweet, bitter, or whatever it is. If you can chew and then come to the realization of a single taste, then that is the best kinds of realization you can gain from it. There is nothing else that you need to attain. Because all of the Dharma door that the Buddha had taught is of a single flavor. Let it be of the profound or shallow, good or bad, those are the single taste. That is the emptiness, that is the non-dual teaching. And then he continued to say that my thoughts were extinguished, I entered a samadhi, and and contemplated the awareness of flavor as not having a substance and not being a thing. As a result, my mind transcended all worldly outflows. After he started contemplating in such a way, seeing the nature of mind, if you can do so, whatever you're eating in your mouth, since he has this uh, uh, rumination syndrome, then while chewing and eating at that time, he would 
contemplate upon his awareness or uh, contemplate while chewing his cud. And then he realized that the awareness of flavor is not a substance nor being a thing. As a result, his mind transcended all worldly outflows. So he came to the realization that his awareness and his his body is not his awareness is not his body because the body is inanimate and the awareness is not materialistic because nor of the things that he is chewing because whatever it is the chili or something sweet it is not that either so it is not just the things that you're chewing nor of the body it is it transcends the things that we can point to so within one moment he transcended all the outflows, all the worldly outflows. And then he continued to say that internally I was freed of body and mind and externally I abandoned the world. I left the three existence far behind just like a bird released from its cage. I separated from filth and wiped out defi defilements and so my dharma I became pure and I accomplished arhatship. At that time he had already attained the uh, selflessness of uh, phenomena, and for such a reason, he's parted from the three existences, just like how a bird finally is freed from a cage and uh, parted from all kinds of defilement. He had attained our hood. And then the thus come one certified me in person and as having ascended to the path beyond study. The Buddha asked about a perfect penetration as I have been certified to it, returning flavor and turning awareness around is the superior method. So if you return to look for the source of flavor, which is the nature of mind, the true face of Tathagatagarbha, then you would be able to see its source to see the truth. And I would say that is the first and foremost the Dharma door. So to him, the tongue, the, the, the sense organ of the tongue is the most essential. Though he's, he has a rumination sickness, but to him it became the cause for his liberation. Whomsoever those five disciples were, uh, are, in fact, part of their um, defiled sensory organs somehow became the cause that leads to their realization. Their defected sensory organs had something to do with their previous life and their previous negative karma. However, it turns out to be their cause to lead to realization. For such reason, the Kempos and Kempos should also encourage your own disciples to persistently um, bring out their realization out of their uh, deficiencies and try to communicate with them more compassionately. Now this is the causes and conditions that's expounded in the Shurangama Sutra. So now we have already finished our Shurangama Sutra today. Next week we will have the Sutra of Basket dis Display and the Shurangama Sutra as well. <laughs>